it is, it is my great um, pleasure and privilege to, to share with you uh, uh, some insights about Wallace's species notebook, which I, I have come to believe is maybe the most, um, the most interesting and important lens through which we can understand the development of Wallace's evolutionary thinking through the, the 1850s. Um, this, uh, th this uh, when I, th my title, The Conciliant Mr. Wallace, is a reference to a point that I had made earlier in my talk in the, in the morning session, and that is this idea that Wallace is, we see him working in this species notebook in what I call consilience mode. Um, for those of you that were not here this morning, consilience being this, uh, this idea uh, first articulated by the philosopher of science, William Huell, in a book published in 1840, um, the idea that you know, one way to get a sense of if you're on the right track in terms of a scientific explanation is if the explanatory framework you've got explains several, ideally many, disparate lines of evidence. So when working in consilience mode, you're looking to tie together otherwise seemingly unrelated lines of evidence. And I think that that, that is very much in evidence in, in Wallace's thinking. Uh, in, the, in the species notebook. What is this notebook? Well, this notebook has been, of course, known to historians for quite a long time. It was given to the Linnaean Society of London in 1936 by Wallace's son, William. Uh, and it's been studied, uh, I'll say a little bit about that, um, but, but heretofore never published, and mm, to my knowledge, perhaps not analyzed in any great detail. Like most of Wallace's notebooks, this is really two notebooks in one. Um, probably to economize on you know, toting around books in the field and on paper, Wallace tended to use his notebooks in both directions simultaneously, sort of in inverted with respect to one another. So there's one side that I call the recto notebook, which consists of about 181 pages of entries, and then a reverse side, the verso side of the notebook, another 77 pages of entries. And I want to give you a sense that this notebook is very much a um, a working notebook. It is a, it is a day book. It is a diary. It is a journal. It is a memorandum book. And it is a notebook in which he writes extensive narrative about his ideas. Um, most importantly, from our point of view, from my point of view today, his evolutionary ideas. Um, I mentioned that the notebook had been, been studied, um, in particular by a historian named uh, Lewis McKinney, who published some very important papers in the late 1960s and published this book that you see here, 1972, called Wallace and Natural Selection. And McKinney is the first to have pointed out through his studies of this notebook that um, Wallace reveals in this notebook his plans to publish a book arguing for evolution. And it was McKinney, actually, that suggested the title that I adopted in a sort of homage to, to McKinney's efforts. Um, McKinney noted that on page 35, uh, Wallace um, heads a very long and interesting section, a note for organic law of change, you know, this phrase, the or organic law of change. And McKinney suggested that in the spirit of the titles of many of the papers that Wallace wrote, he may have entitled uh, a paper on this subject or a book on this subject um, on the organic law of change. And um, so I've, I've adopted this as the title of, um, of this book that, as Richard mentioned, has, has just uh, very recently been published by Harvard University Press. Now, just to give you a sense of um, what I mean by saying this is day book, journal, memorandum book, etc., you know, this book, um, looking at that, I think that would give you uh, a good sense of the challenge that we faced or I faced in transcribing this notebook. Um, this is just an example of you know, the various kinds of jottings and entries, in some cases sketches, like this is a sketch for an insect case. Um, here we have page one, headed by entomological notes, Seidong River, Borneo, but superimposed, you see again, sketches for an insect um, case for, for his collections. We see extensive entries on his insect collecting. Uh, we see, for example, um, kind of trying to keep track of, of, of species. Uh, he used this technique of pasting in wings and using the wing venation to identify specimens. So this is a little, on, on many pages, we find insect wings. We find day-to-day -day tabulations of collections. Here are drawings of insect mouthparts. 
um, caterpillars. Um, here's some observations of an interesting brented beetle that he had, um, had been observing. Um, one of those examples, and I'll mention a couple more, of observations in this notebook that made it into other uh, uh, publications such as the Malay Archipelago. Here we find extensive narrative sections on uh, collecting birds of paradise and the behavior of birds of paradise. Um, someone had mentioned, I forget who it was, it may have been Andrew, it may have been Errol, about the, the, the question about um, how they displayed their plumes. And you see Wallace in this notebook sketching very deliberately, this is the proper way that the plumes ought to be um, deployed. And so here, for example, is narrative with, um, with, with two kind of bird of paradise, you know, long plumes, heads of birds of paradise, and, and, and so on, many sketches. Um, very poignantly, um, with reference to Barute's very eloquent talk um, just a few minutes ago, um, it's in this notebook that we find extensive narrative descriptions of Wallace's hunts of, of, of orangutans. And uh, this would be an example, which is very, uh, many of these narrative sections are striking for how lightly edited they are. They, they make it into books like the Malay Archipelago almost verbatim. And it's truly, you know, a testament to, um, to, to, to uh, Wallace's um, skills as a, as a writer that he edits himself very, very, very lightly, ultimately. What he writes out um, first off is very beautifully expressed, and it makes it into print in that way. This, for example, uh, a section headed Amias Hunt, um, the local, uh, a local name uh, for the orangutans, Amias, uh, we, f we find... Uh, this very passage, almost verbatim, in uh, the Malay Archipelago, uh, for, for example. In other passages, um, we see Wallace at, at his most creative, I mean, all sorts of interesting schemes and plans and helpful suggestions of various kinds. Um, he has a scheme, this may be the egalitarian in Wallace, um, for impecunious naturalists um, who can't afford to join the learned societies uh, who can't afford their own library. Why not form a shared library of natural history? And he has a scheme um, laid out in the notebook how to, how to form um, through sharing of different learned societies like the Zoological Society, Entomological, and the Linnaean, for example, the formation of a complete library of natural history that all naturalists will equally have, have access to. He has um, many, many pages where he's experimenting with efficient label designs, uh, which must have been all-consuming, um, you know, considering the, the um, you know, tens of thousands of insect specimens that he's, he's pinning and, and, and labeling. Um, he has schemes to halt the proliferation of taxonomic synonyms, which is, you know, the bane of any, of any systematic um, naturalist. And actually, this, this is just one of about four different proposals, how to stop the proliferation of synonyms. It's, it's, it's really uh, pretty, pretty funny. Um, and then there are other observations that are squarely um, ethnological, um, speculations about um, humans, um, uh, uh, entries like the ones I, see, I show you here as examples, the Alfurs um, or the Timor people, very close and, and, and clear observations. But then also we find him recording um, notes or, or anecdotes. Any, he's interested in, in human-animal, uh, human-primate relationships, and we see him speculating on that to some extent in his entries on orangutans. And we also see him collecting um, examples. For example, um, uh, a, a physician that had told him about a case of individuals born with an extended coccyx, so a tail. And so he's, he's viewing the, the idea that occasionally people are born with tails as sort of another line of evidence linking us with, with, the, uh, with, with the rest of the animal world. He noted mythological or legendary accounts of, in, of people with tails. For example, you see here from um, Greek mythology, uh, satyrs that would often be depicted mythologically as, as having tails. Uh, he was interested in these examples, thinking that the, that the myth and legend may have some little grain in, uh, of, of truth to them. But of course, the overriding theme uh, of the species notebook is Wallace's pursuit of the so-called species question, the, the, uh, this topic that I discussed earlier today. And I like to, to sort of underscore that Wallace, he didn't travel to collect, right? He wasn't simply driven by a, a love of collecting. R rather, you know, I, I believe that 
Wallace collected to travel. I mean, collecting for him was a means to an end. We've heard several times now how well, Wallace was impecunious. He was, um, he was a working collector, but he's, you know, he, he's, he's collecting in order to stay and collect, first of all, private material and make observations, record observations in the lush tropics of the world. Why? With an eye towards the species question. That's the overriding concern, I believe, that he has. Now, let me tell you up front, you know, what's not in the species notebook. What, you know, maddeningly, what's not in the species notebook is, um, you know, entries where Wallace reveals all about his discovery of natural selection and speculates, you know, about, about the nature of struggle for existence or Malthus and, and so on. No, you know, I mean, Wallace is um, just maddeningly um, silent in virtually all of his writings, almost all of his writings, about um, his thinking that led him specifically to, to natural selection. So in this notebook, um, the, the temporally uh, closest entry we have, January 20th, 1858, from the island of Jilolo, um, modern-day Halmahera, we have this um, th Wallace, again, putting on his you know, creativity hat here, trying to come up with an, a good explanation for the vast grassy plains of tropical areas, of which this island you know, has a nice example. Uh, the Llanos of Brazil would be another nice example. And it's a puzzle, you know, why in otherwise heavily forested areas of the tropics would you have grassy plains? You know, what's going on there? And he has a proposed explanation that's not at all unreasonable. And in his explanation, there are elements of differential dispersal of grass seed versus tree seeds and competition. Who gets there first and gets established and then can crowd out the seedlings of the other species? So that's an interesting kind of, you know, selection dynamic, if you will, com competition dynamic. That's about the closest we get in terms of a dated entry to the time that we know he had his sudden insight into natural selection. But really, it's quite maddening. And even on the verso side of this notebook, in a, tab in a table listing day by day what's going on in January and February, there is a gap precisely where it is known he had this insight. So that's very disappointing. But I wanted to let you know up front, in case you buy the book, just to find out. You know what? <laughs> okay. Well, but what is in the notebook? What is in the notebook is utterly fascinating. Transmutation, right? Um, transformism, transmutation, their term for evolution, what we call evolution, and related topics, they take up a great deal of space in this notebook. Very, very interesting. Um, about 20 pages of entries on geographical distribution. Now, on all of these topics, angled towards the species question, angled towards an understanding of evolution. Um, geographical distribution, 29 pages on um, affinity, what they called affinity, um, comparative anatomy, morphological relationships between organisms, instinct and habit. Um, humans, some of that simply ethnographic observation, some of it not, all right, but about 14 pages with entries bearing on humans. Um, design, um, critiquing arguments for design in nature. The argument from design was, of course, the, the standard um, natural theological approach to understanding many aspects of the natural world, right? That, the, that you know, geographical distribution, morphology, all of these things um, are evidence of beneficent design in some way. But here in the notebook, we find on some 32 pages very poignant arguments against those arguments for design. Very, very interesting. And then very broadly, which I kind of put in this catch-all category of transmutation, entries on some 56 pages, which are absolutely fascinating. And a lot of this is extracts from Charles Lyell's Principles of Geology and Attendant Rebuttals. And I mentioned this earlier, and I'm going to get into it a little bit in a, in a moment, that much of um, Wallace's activity here is aimed at demolishing Charles Lyell's arguments against the possibility that species change, right? Lyle is taken as the definitive statement on that, and he's going to demolish those arguments. And about 24 out of the 56 pages alone are on Lyle, explicitly on Lyle. Now, Wallace, we know, traveled with the fourth edition 
of, of Lyell's principles of geology. Um, you, know, a, you can imagine the arduous conditions under which Wallace is working, a and yet you know, he is kind of schlepping around with him a working library. You know, he's got, he's got a whole little, you know, some cases of books that he's carrying with him in the field. Um, this particular edition came out in four volumes. And in the species notebook, um, here you can see in this table, for example, from page 34, then down on, and then uh, up to 53, and then it jumps to some entries in the 140s and such. I want you to notice how these correspond to entries taken from the principles almost in sequence, right? The whole first set corresponds to volume one, the second set here, volume two, a third set, volume three, and so on. It's almost like in at night, you know, whenever, when he's, he's done packing up his specimens, um, he's sitting down and he's opening up the principles, he's going through it night by night, you know, week by week, systematically picking out those arguments he thinks are the most important, writing them out in the notebook, and then demolishing them after that. Right, so the, so the, the entries are very easy to find in the original, of course. And in fact, in, in here we see him revealing some, some plans. We, we can see him, as I think of it, as sort of out Lyling Lyle, in that he's more consistent than Lyle in terms of the way he wants to apply ch uh, Charles Lyle's own thinking about explaining patterns we see um, not just on um, Earth and Earth history, but the organisms upon the Earth. So here, here is a, a, a comment he says. Um, this is while I'm quoting Wallace, where he says, it would be an extraordinary thing if while the modification of the surface of the Earth occurs by natural causes now in operation, and the extinction of species was the natural result of the same causes, yet the reproduction and introduction of new species required special acts of creation, or some process which does not present itself in the ordinary course of nature. Right, so here we, he's basically saying, Lyle, you're inconsistent. He will apply this idea to the evolution of the Earth and its surface, but draw the line at applying that reasoning to the organisms. So he's saying, you're inconsistent. He's outlying Lyle. At the end of this passage, Wallace writes, introduce this, this point, and disprove all Lyle's arguments first at the commencement of my last chapter. And of course, a last chapter implies many chapters, where this is one indication of the planned structure for a book, okay? A sampling of topics from the principles that he's attacking in the species notebook. Without getting into them in any detail, just a summary of, the, of some of the topics. This is a sampler. Pattern of progression evident in the fossil record. A critique of the argument for balance and harmony in nature. Islands, right? The significance of isolation. The significance of endemism, unique species found only on certain islands. And um, the antiquity, an idea, you know, we see Wallace very creatively sort of seeing that there's, it's not a coincidence that the oldest islands also have the highest level or highest proportion of unique species, what we would call endemics. And younger islands lack that. So he has a sense that that's, of course, because of the antiquity, there is time for transmutation, for the formation of new species. And contrary, I think, to Wallace's um, rhetorical approach in the Ternate paper, his, dis his paper announcing the discovery of natural selection opens with uh, making a point about domestication and how it's a red herring and we can't learn anything about it. In fact, he's th this is taken from Lyle. He's sidestepping an issue that Lyle makes much about. And he's actually setting this up rhetorically to say, ultimately, um, you know, yes, they're artificial, they're contrived, but let's look at species in nature. But in the species notebook, there's a very different tune. In the species notebook, we find Wallace writing extensively about lessons from domestication, that domesticated organisms inherently teach us of the possibility of transmutation, right? Yeah. And there are many, many other interesting topics. Um, topics on morphology and how they provide clues to transmutation, how embryology informs classification, how structure and habit don't often go hand in hand. So again, part of that argument against design, um, structure is not perfect and perfectly adapted to certain circumstances, right? You sometimes find you know, that structure and habit don't match. Um, 
related to this extended argument uh, uh, critiquing design in nature, he's very explicit uh, in, and very modern in his understanding that evolutionary history is one of branching lineages. It's a genealogical history. It is not a linear species A, changes to species B, changes to species C. We see him in, in several passages talking about the branching pattern of lineages over time. Very, very important. Um, this is sort of underscore uh, a point that I made earlier too. Uh, I was struck in analyzing this notebook at the, the remarkable congruence in thinking between Wallace and Darwin. And what we see is that both of them, independently unknown to one another, were pursuing precisely the same lines of evidence. They were often reading the same authors. They were making notes of the same sorts of observations from many of the same authors. Remarkable congruence. This is a sampler. For you know, just a, a, a quick example, um, here we have observations and arguments for transmutation, pages in the species notebook where all of these topics can be found. And then we have precisely the same topics in Darwin's writings, in his notebooks, in his The Forerunner to the, to, uh, the Origin of Species, his Natural Selection Manuscript, and in The Origin itself. And this is not exhaustive. No, there's you know, geology and paleontology. All of these, too, they, there, are, there are beautiful congruences between Wallace's insights and Darwin's insights. Um, doesn't stop there. Observations on instinct and habit. Um, observations on the human primate relationship, um, observations on geographical distribution. It goes on and on. The congruences to me are, are astounding. Darwin came to an understanding of selection, and then he went into this what I call consilience mode, pursuing many lines of evidence in light of his theory, his new theory. And here we have um, Wallace kind of you know, coming to un uh, uh, accepting the idea of evolutionary change first, more than a decade before he actually solved this mystery. But what is remarkable is that he did solve that mystery, that against all odds, right, in little more than a decade after setting out to figure out the mechanism of species change, this self-educated guy, right, with no, with very little money, with no connections, with no, with very little by way of resources, through his own creativity and tenacity, succeeded in this. It truly is remarkable. So 1845, as I mentioned this morning, he becomes convinced of the reality that species change, launches his first expedition a few years later with his good friend Henry Walter Bates, ends disastrously, launches very soon after his second expedition um, to, in pursuit of the species question in the Malay Archipelago. And here we are, 1858, actually hits upon the principle of, of natural selection. Um, we know that Darwin sent Wallace the table of contents of his planned book, Natural Selection. We know that because here it is. Wallace copied it out into the species notebook. And he was sketch of Mr. Darwin's natural selection, chapter one, two, three, and so on and so forth, laying it all out. I think that this immediately led um, Wallace to simply abandon his planned book on the subject. So just to kind of wrap up here, um, you know, insights from the, from the species notebook. I mean, there are many things I'm struck by. Certainly one of them is the depth and breadth of Wallace's uh, evolutionary insights in this notebook. I mean, like no document I've ever read by or about Wallace um, of, of that period in particular, um, this is astounding in revealing exactly the working method that Wallace has in accumulating evidence, voraciously reading, pondering, and creatively thinking about elements of an argument in favor of, of evolutionary change or in the 1850s. Um, it also makes abundantly clear to me that Wallace's evolutionary foil, if you will, is Lyle. Right? There's very good evidence, I think, when you, you, you read the Sarawak Law paper of 1855 and the Ternate essay of 1858 and cross-reference entries and the arguments and observations in those papers with Charles Lyell's Principles of Geology, there's often a striking correspondence. Um, clearly, Wallace had Lyell in mind, and I suspect that on the organic law of change, this book that, that wasn't, that Wallace was planning, 
would have been structured in the way we see in this notebook. He would have structured it exactly by laying out the leading arguments by Lyle, right, the leading opposing voice against evolution, and demolishing those, those arguments. If you can convince Lyle, the leading man of science, against the idea, then of course you've got it made. You know, of Wallace's, um, upon receiving and reading his copy of On the Origin of Species while still deep in the Malay archipelago, um, he, he wrote, you know, sort of effusively uh, in, in praise, you know, he, and, and he, he said, the force of admiration can no further go. Um, he, he really genuinely regarded Darwin's achievement as monumental, a monumental achievement. And he went on, you know, in, in, in letters to, to friends and family, um, praising the origins, vast accumulation of evidence, its overwhelming argument, its admirable tone and spirit. Uh, truly, it's a, it's a remarkable achievement and, and our loss that he didn't ultimately decide to come forth early on after re returning from his voyage uh, to, to articulating his own book, his own statement on the evolutionary process. It's quite unfortunate. You know, this waited quite a long time until the book that most scholars point to as Wallace's version of the On the Origin of Species is his 1889 book, Darwinism. Um, well, with that, uh, I thank you very much for your, for your attention. Yeah.